This is our 66th class in this series about understanding God's righteousness, and it is the sixth in the subseries addressing the issue of judgment. This coincidence with the relationship between being class 66 and number six in judgment was not premeditated, it just happened. I just note this because it is the transition from six to seven that embraces the concept of judgment. A six is the number that scripturally and creationally projects the curse of sin and death and all its oppressive applications. We sometimes hear the number six spiritually identified with simply man or simply sin. It's the number of sin. While those are technically correct associations, that application is much more comprehensive. The number six offers an umbrella identification of all that is related to the Edenic curse, while the number seven is related to a rest from sin, but not a complete elimination of sin, as that would be the number eight. In order for there to be a rest from sin, which is represented in that number seven, there has to be a suppression of sin, and all those terrible physical effects of sin that is projected or are projected in the number six. And this transition is judgment. This is why that second harvest feast, that shadow prophesies of the second divine harvest in the Creator's plan, is identified by both double sixes and double sevens. There were three mandated feasts in the first kingdom age, as I think we've noted previously in this class, those, those three harvest weeks are very sharp and crisp shadow projections of the three divine harvests in God's plan. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a perfect representation and prophecy of both that first immortalization of Jesus Christ, as well as the ultimate, as well as projecting the ultimate salvation of all creation by the complete elimination of death and therefore sin in that eighth millennium, that eighth divine day. This dual application is why the Feast of Unleavened Bread, along with Passover, is prophesied as being observed during the Millennial Kingdom. Yet, despite the third feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, also being prophesied as being observed on a, on a scale that embraces a global level, we oddly do not see any reference to the Feast of Weeks being observed during the future kingdom. The reason for that is that this feast shadow projects the second scheduled divine harvest in God's plan, which is the one in which we hope to participate. That is the one harvest feast that will have no further application once it's completed. About 2,000 years ago, after the first one, as has been repeatedly prophesied, the substance will have been completely revealed, eliminating the need for the shadow testimony. This is exactly the result for the full maturity of God's plan. When all things are revealed, when the heavenly substance is finally and fully revealed with the complete elimination of death and sin and God will be all in all. Then there'll only be light with no darkness whatsoever, no shadows, no night. We read this in Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse. Well, that pretty much defines the period when death is eliminated. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no lamp, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The equation is that when there is no more curse, there'll be no more darkness. One will not even need a lamp in a windowless room. Without darkness, when light is supplied from every direction, there are no shadows whatsoever. 
This is why the Feast of Weeks is not prophesied as being observed during the Millennial Kingdom. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles will be required to be observed. They will still be heavenly substance to be revealed in those two harvest feasts. But after the first set of saints will be immortalized in that transition from the sixth divine day into the seventh, there'll be no need for those earthly shadows. I believe we've noted how this second divine harvest defines the salvation event in which we hope to participate at some point in the next few years, most probably about the year 2030, as that will be the 2000 year anniversary of the first salvation event in God's plan. We will note in a minute uh, this double six and double seven identification with this second harvest feast and therefore the second divine harvest or immortalization event. One of the most obvious identifications of the Feast of Weeks uh, to that second divine harvest would be the parable of Jesus about the wheat and the tares. Jesus directly identifies this parable as a likeness of the kingdom of heaven, meaning, of course, the heavenly source and the heavenly nature of that kingdom, not its geographical location. We read this in uh, Matthew 13, picking up at verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not thou sow good seed in your field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay lest while you gather up the tares, you rip up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together the first, the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This parable of the kingdom is, is defined as the wheat harvest. Now, this is the, was the specific harvest of the Feast of Weeks. Sadly, this is often not recognized in our community. Oddly, the Feast of Weeks is often associated with the salvation of Jesus, and the Feast of Tabernacles is often identified with the second divine harvest scheduled for the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. That is completely impossible understanding but it is very commonly presumed in our brotherhood today and oddly for some time now. We see in Exodus uh, chapter 34 uh, this distinction of the uh, Feast of Weeks being identified as the uh, wheat harvest. So Exodus 34 verse 21, Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest in earring time, and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. That, of course, referred to the Feast of Tabernacles. One one re recognizes that the wheat harvest identifies the second salvation event, that second divine harvesting event in God's plan. Then we have the capacity to listen for those Bible echoes that identify that wheat harvest in relation to the context of this parable and how that context shadow testifies of that second divine harvest at the beginning of the seventh divine day. Now, this would include how the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Israel from the Philistines on that cart that was drawn by cows who had recently calved. This was the miraculous return of the Christ Ark to Israel. It was the wheat harvest, and the ark came to Beth Shemesh, and this is a shadow projection of the return of Christ to Israel. Now, first, it was the wheat harvest. Second, we have the miraculous return 
of that Christ ark. Third, was the, it, it was in the seventh month since it had been captured by the Philistines. And fourth, the location is Beth Shemesh, which means house of the sun. This was a major center of pagan sun worship in Israel. The fact that the Christ Ark is miraculously returned to a center of pagan worship in Israel is a shadow projection of how Christ will return to Israel when they are still in a condition of apostasy and faithlessness. Compounding this understanding is how tens of thousands in Beth Shemesh die when they open the ark to look inside. When Christ does miraculously return to Israel, it will be at a time when two-thirds of the Jews at Jerusalem are being slaughtered by that Gogian six-nation confederacy. Another one of those six and seven pattern projections, as this will be after the immortalization of the saints in that seventh day, when that Armageddon battle will be settled by Jesus after a huge Jewish death toll, just like Beth Shemesh, that six-nation confederacy, will be destroyed in the beginning of the seventh divine day, facilitating the repentance of the Jewish people and the recognition of their Messiah. We read in 1 Samuel 6, And the men did so, and took two milk kine, and, bed, uh, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord uh, upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds. And the kine, the cattle, took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, how appropriate, a Beth Shemite, and stood there, where there was a great stone. And they claved the wood of the cart, and offered the kine, or the cattle, a burnt offering unto the Lord. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. The pinhole observation of that event being time-stamped as the wheat harvest is what opens up that shadow representation of the substance of this of the event surrounding the return of Jesus Christ. And we see a, a similar representation with the events surrounding the plague on Israel that is stopped at Jerusalem at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, when fire from heaven consumes the burnt and peace offerings that David prepared at that point due to the plague. That location that was subsequently chosen for the construction of the temple that the son of David would build, this was also identified as the time of wheat harvest, which associates these events with the Feast of Weeks and Christ's parable of the wheat harvest and the tares representing the kingdom. David had ordered a military census in Israel, but he hadn't followed God's rules in that process. It certainly wasn't a sin to require a census, but there had to be a redemption payment, a tax of a half shekel, or there would be a plague. That redemption tax was highly appropriately defined as an atonement procedure. This is one of those several bloodless atonement procedures that highlight the foolishness of the current acceleration within our enlightened community, distorting the terms of God's righteousness by limiting the principle of atonement as exclusively sin forgiveness. There were several bloodless atonement procedures mandated by God, just as there were four bloodless altar offering categories that were agriculturally sourced. So we read in Exodus chapter 30, picking up at verse 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, 
Then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When you number them, that there be no plague among them, when you number them. This they shall give every one that passes among them that are numbered. Half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and a shekel is twenty giraz. And half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Every one that passes among them that are numbered, from twenty years old and above, indicating this is a military census, shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. So it wasn't wrong for David to ask for a military census, but it was wrong for him not to require that half-shekel tax for everyone being counted. That half-shekel tax is defined as qualifying as an atonement for the lives of those counted. That distinction is repeated, so this atonement identification cannot legitimately be discounted. Let's also note that the consequence for imposing a military census, and counting those 20 years old and older, without requiring that atoning half-shekel tax, was suffering a plague, which is exactly what happened as a consequence to David's census, for which no half-shekel tax appears to have been required. So David realizes he made a mistake. Yes, there was, there is an application in simply trusting in God's military support so that it doesn't really matter what a military census reports. I mean, God can save with many or with few. He'd already demonstrated that many times in the history of the enlightened community. But as wonderful as David was as a brother in the truth, he did have ego issues surfacing at times, such as that affair with Bathsheba and the death of his friend Uriah, as well as this unnecessary military census that resulted in a terrible plague. So, in this context of this series of events, we have a timestamp of the wheat harvest, which is, once again, the timing of the Feast of Weeks, which is a shadow projection of the second salvation event in God's plan. In First Chronicles 21, picking up at verse 18, we read, then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. <coughs> wheat. <coughs> Excuse me. Ornan was threshing wheat. This was the the time of the wheat harvest, the timing framework for Christ's parable of the kingdom, the harvest of the wheat and the tares, the same time stamp for identifying that second harvest feast, the Feast of Weeks. Once again, we have a situation where many Israelites are dying, but there's a miraculous salvation that stops those deaths at Jerusalem, uh, and this is uh, before the conclusion before that third day of the plague, which is also a parallel to that second immortalization, which is also before the third day, or um, actually at the beginning of that third day. Um, the third day is uh, uh, from that first salvation event of Jesus of Nazareth, of course. Again, there will be a lot of Israelites dying at Armageddon at Jerusalem, which is just after the immortalization of the saints as the saints are described as being with Jesus on the Mount of Olives, when he uses that sword out of his mouth to command the features of creation to stop the deaths of the Jews at Jerusalem, to destroy five-sixths of the Gogian gang of six in that seventh divine day since creation with, with earthquakes, volcanic activity, 
lightning storms, disease, and panic. In parallel fashion, fire issues from heaven to consume the burnt and peace offerings on the altar that David constructed on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, where he had been threshing wheat. This results in the plague ending, just as earthquakes and fire from heaven stops the Gogian-led butchering of the Jews at Armageddon, at that substance casting the Feast of Weeks. In First First Chronicles chapter 21, we read, And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. So this identification of the Feast of Weeks, the wheat harvest, is a projection of the second divine harvesting event, the second immortalization event in God's plan. We not only have Christ's parable of the wheat and tares, we have depth and breadth to this understanding by considering uh, parallel shadow projections of that second divine harvesting by considering recorded historical events in the context of that same wheat harvest. So our point was that the transition from six to seven embraces the concept of judgment. It is a transition from six to seven, from the oppressive features of the curse of sin and death to a divinely provided rest from sin and all those oppressive effects. The judgment we will soon face at Christ's tribunal is timed for that transition from the sixth divine day, the sixth millennium, into the seventh divine day, the seventh millennium. The six to seven transition, identifying judgment, is validated by the events recorded on the first day of the Feast of Weeks, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This this day, of course, is called Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. This is the day that Jesus promised, uh, but did not specifically identify, when he commanded his disciples to stay in Jerusalem after he ascended to heaven, because the promise of the Father would be given to them at Jerusalem. So, We read in Acts chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You've heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. The events that took place in Pentecost... That first day of the Feast of Weeks, that wheat harvest, is a projection of the second salvation event in the Creator's plan. That six to seven transition identification with judgment is doubly emphasized in that day of of Pentecost. Um, the, The first day of the Feast of Weeks is always both a high Sabbath as well as the 50th day following that day when the first fruits of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are waved to heaven, which is the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day after that high Sabbath that immediately followed Passover. A high Sabbath is a day that qualifies as a Sabbath without any necessary identification with a Saturday or a seventh day such as the first day of each of the three harvest feast weeks, and just like the Day of Atonement, as well as certain other days. That waving of the first fruits of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was done on the 16th day of the first month. So exactly 50 days later would be that first day of the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. This was therefore the 66th day of every year. But in the year 30 of the Common Era, that 66th day 
was also a Saturday, just like that Saturday Sabbath that was the 10th of Nisan, when Jesus was chosen to be the national Passover lamb four days before Passover, in accordance with the command of God that the Passover lamb had to be chosen and set apart exactly four days before Passover. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that previously unridden colt to shouts of Hosanna, son of David, meaning save us now, son of David. Jesus was nationally chosen to save the enlightened community, to be that Passover lamb that would save from death on that tenth day of Nisan, which was a Saturday Sabbath in the year 30 of the Common Era, the year of the death and resurrection of our Savior. The 66th day of that year, that first day of the Feast of Weeks, that shadow projection of the second divine harvest in God's plan, was therefore not only double sixes, as it was the 66th day of the year, it was also double sevens, because it wasn't only a Saturday Sabbath. It was also a high Sabbath, that being the first day of the Feast of Weeks. The Sabbath is endlessly identified with the number seven throughout Scripture. This double six and double seven identification for this shadow projection of the doubled salvation experience, first Jesus, and then secondly, that first set of saints two millenniums later, demands the principle of judgment to be applied. The reason for this is in order to transition from six to seven, from the unrestrained application and power and influence of sin with all those resulting oppressive physical consequences to the restraining of sin and the rest from all those oppressive physical effects of sin and that rest that's going to be enjoyed throughout creation in that Sabbath millennium. Before the rest from sin can be realized, there will have to be a reckoning with that foundational purpose of vindicating the righteousness of the Creator. It is judgment that permits this rest from the physical effects of sin, and this is why that shadow prophecy of that initiation of the Sabbath rest kingdom, the events at Pentecost, is double identified by six and seven. Let's note one other interesting time stamp while we are considering these numbers that are hidden exclusively for those within the enlightened community with circumcised hearts and therefore eyes to see and ears to hear. This is the time frame from the national choosing of Jesus to be the Passover lamb to save from death to that Pentecost day, that shadow prophecy of the first immortalization of the saints, saints and the rest from sin. That is a period of 56 days. The day Israel was commanded to choose the Passover lamb was four days before Passover, which was always on the 14th day of the first month. Therefore, that Passover lamb assignment was the 10th day of the year, and certainly in the year of our Savior's death, that was a Saturday, the 10th of Nisan, when Jesus paraded into Jerusalem on that, again, formerly unridden, unbroken cold. Pentecost was always the 66th day of the year, and that leaves 56 days between those iconic days, which is eight sets of seven. Now that should be a familiar number pattern. This seven, eight timestamp courses all through scripture. The six to seven progression highlights judgment and the progression from sin's oppression to the divinely provided rest from sin resulting from the vindication of God's righteousness. The seven, eight progression basically represents the progression from that rest from sin to that complete elimination of sin and all those oppressive consequences of sin of which death is the most oppressive of all those consequences. Highly appropriately, there is another judgment 
preceding that complete elimination of sin. The power that affords this transition from 6 to 7, and then from 7 to 8, is the issue of judgment, or more correctly defined, the vindication of God's righteousness. That vindication of God's rightness is the catalyst permitting the transition from sin's unrestrained influence and all those unpleasant consequences of that uh, to that restraining of sin and that initial rest from the physical effects of sin. The catalyst permitting the transition from that rest from sin to the complete elimination of sin and all those resulting effects of sin like death, disease, decay, tears, sorrow, etc., is again the final vindication of God's righteousness. And this is why there is a judgment and an immortalization at those transition points, at the beginning of the seventh divine day and the beginning of the eighth divine day. This is why the first resurrection of the saints is expressed in Hosea 6 as being after two days and on the third day, indicating two divine days, 2,000 years, after the first resurrection and on the third day following that first resurrection, indicating the beginning of the seventh divine day, the Sabbath rest millennium. This is also why that second resurrection is expressed through the promise to reality timestamps of the three transfiguration accounts as being after six days, therefore identifying the beginning of the seventh day. But then Luke's account of the transfiguration presents that time stamp from promise to fulfillment being about eight days, which is a reference to the third immortalization event in that eighth divine day. Apparently that transfiguration took place late uh, on that seventh day from the time that Jesus had made the promise that there were some standing by him that would not die before witnessing the kingdom of God. But the inspired text defines that period in two separate ways. Matthew 17 and Mark 9 define the promise to fulfillment as being after six days. And Luke 9 defines the promise to fulfillment as being about or approximately eight days. Those two uh, separate points of emphasis highlight the timing of those two salvation events that follow those two judgment events. So if we want to experience that transition from six to seven, we have to experience that judgment of God, that vindication of God's righteousness over which God's Son will preside. So what are the terms of our judgment. On what basis can we hope to survive that transition from the oppressive curse of sin and death into the glorious Sabbath-like rest from that curse? It's often assumed that all we need is forgiveness, that if we're forgiven of all our sins at the point of our judgment, that then we'll automatically qualify as those who will be invited to inherit the kingdom. That's a foolish, heart-generated oversimplification. It can be dismissed through quite a number of obvious directions. That basis would mean that well, babies, toddlers, who died before any degree of maturity, who never had the capacity to generate any contradictions to God's righteousness, who wouldn't have any sins to even be forgiven, would automatically be immortalized. Although never actually responding to God's invitation to enlightenment, the ritual of baptism, a shadow projection of the righteousness of God's judgment of death for sin, as well as his judgment of renewing life on the basis of his grace, that ritual is only offered to those mature enough to be enlightened and choose that righteousness of God over the serpent-based presumptions issuing from the human heart. That conclusion would also inappropriately suggest that one just baptized before experiencing Christ's judgment will automatically qualify to inherit the kingdom. But God's judgments are not based on technicalities. And God's offer 
of salvation is not bound or chained by technicalities. The human heart, that serpent throne, craves simplicity, insists on simple, unbalanced answers. The heart-controlled mind clings to oversimplified expressions. Within that always invariably intentionally complex testimony of God and Christ, it's only the always rare circumcised heart, even within the enlightened community, that will be unsatisfied with simplistic presumptions. This is why only a single Christadelphian, one man in the entire world, actually believed the testimony of Jesus at the end of his ministry. It was that thief on the cross who asked to be remembered when Christ came in his kingdom, despite dying on that cross beside that now reformed thief. As we've noted before, the only people waiting outside the tomb in that, at that day and time that Jesus testified he would return to life were those Roman guards. And the women who loved him came hours later at the conclusion of the Sabbath at the beginning of the next day with burial spices. Despite the fact that Jesus had raised three people from the dead back to life, despite the fact that he'd healed many from horrible conditions like leprosy, epilepsy, blindness, paralysis, a horribly withered hand, despite the fact that he could generate food enough to feed 5,000 people from just a little bread and fish, despite the fact that he could command high winds and waves to be immediately calm and peaceful, despite all this, not a single Christadelphian was even curious enough to wait outside that tomb after those reported three days and three nights of death. So yes, the testimony of God and Jesus is intentionally complicated because the foundational divine goal is quality, not quantity. Our energetic pursuit of that goal of possessing God's image and likeness. So our first responsibility in satisfying the qualifications for an acceptable judgment would be actually believing the real truths hidden in that always intentionally complex testimony about the rightness of our Creator and His Son, His Son who will determine if we're invited to progress from that sin-cursed six and that blessed rest from sin in that seventh divine day. Christ's judgment is that filter separating the burden of six from the blessing of seven. All we have time to do at this point will be to just introduce the issue of the terms of our judgment uh, that's going to result in a judgment of either eternal life or eternal death. To do this, we're going to consider a shadow prophecy of the measuring tools Jesus will use when he measures us in that judging or measuring process to determine if we will qualify to become the heavenly sanctuaries of God. That heavenly projection of the tabernacle at Sinai and the subsequent temples at Jerusalem serve as a common salvation representation throughout Scripture. And we'll, we'll look at this heavenly sanctuary precedent in our next class. But I wanted to introduce this consideration to encourage your thought process uh, until our next class. This is the beginning of Ezekiel's vision of the millennial kingdom. First, we see the timestamp for this vision of the kingdom, which is also Ezekiel's third cherubim vision. It's that same 10th day of the first month of the year, that day that the Passover lamb was always chosen and set apart. Ezekiel was transported in vision to Jerusalem, not literally, but he saw everything in his mind. The very first thing the prophet sees is a brass man with two measuring tools. The brass man has a six cubit reed, as well as a line of flax that has, not, uh, has no limited measure to it as the reed did. These two measuring tools are used to measure the various components of that fourth divine sanctuary. These two measuring tools of the brass man project the two basic categories 
of judgment, of measurement, that we will face at Christ's tribunal, that portal, that doorway between six and seven. These are sin and righteousness. Our lives are going to be measured to see how we have avoided sin and reconciled sin and how we have understood and demonstrated God's righteousness in all that we have said and done and thought. So in our next considerations, we will begin to examine the terms by which we will be judged by Jesus Christ and the angels to determine if we will become the eternal companions of Jesus and hopefully be made like unto the angels.